Hi there again, this is David and welcome to the uh, second part of this um, mini course. And yeah, let's get into it. I think today we're going to learn some really cool stuff. So I'm excited. Hope you're excited as well. Now, yesterday we covered the nine levels on the entrepreneur's journey. If you haven't seen that video, please go back and watch it because it's very important that you watch that first before you watch the second one. Because although we're not going to be uh, covering two, you know, we're not going to be going through what we uh, learned yesterday. There's still a lot of new material here that will once in a while reference to what we learned yesterday. So please, if you haven't watched the first video, please go back and watch it first. It's a very short video. It's about 23 minutes or so or 27. I don't remember, but uh, it's very important that you check that out first before you come and watch this one. So uh, assuming you have watched yesterday's video, let's move on. Now, I don't know whether you've heard this before, uh, I suppose you might have, but um, people say, rightfully so, I think you might agree, that entrepreneurship is two-thirds in a game and one-third out a game. What does that mean? It means that uh, a third of the efforts that contribute to entrepreneurial success are about, you know, the kind of business you build, how you run your operations, the kind of team you build, and, you know, the external things, you know, your sales, your promotions, your marketing, your product, all that stuff, everything that is outside of you, that's the outer game. So, surprisingly, the inner game, which comprises of two-thirds of our efforts, is what actually counts the most. That's why they say that business or entrepreneurship is two-thirds in a game, one-third out of game. So the problem is that a lot of us are never taught this, so we spend a lot of our time, uh, you know, putting in a lot of efforts on kind of perfecting and fixing and building businesses and everything from the outside. We just think of the external elements, but we don't spend that much time looking at the internal elements, yet that is what changes everything, you know? The inner game, when you shift your inner game, automatically the outer game gets better. And when you dramatically transform your inner game, your external game just automatically shifts dramatically as well. So um, the big secret to like massive gains in, in, uh, you know, in, in entrepreneurship is the inner game. I mean, you have to make sure your outer game is, you know, legit and great and, and, and all that. So we're not saying it doesn't count. It does but your inner game is sort of like the, um, um, if you can say the outer game is a tip of the iceberg, the inner game is, you know, the submerged part of the iceberg, the part that nobody sees, but the part that counts the most, okay? So they all count, but inner game is like the big daddy, the big gorilla of entrepreneurship success. All right, so that's what we're going to be talking about and addressing in this video. So are you excited? Because this stuff really gets me excited. In a game is one is my favorite topic when it comes to entrepreneurship. All right, cool. Let's get into it. Now, this is a big question. What do you do if you find out that, like most human beings, you have some kind of uh, subconscious limitations or obstacles that are sabotaging you? And, and they, you know, they run the gamut. Like, there's so many um, um, issues that human beings face. We all, we all have things inside us that kind of trip us up, that make us sabotage ourselves. And uh, so the question is, what do you do when you find yourself with this? Because these are the things that will stop your entrepreneurial success more than the outer game. These inner things, I think you might agree, are more likely to trip you up than external things. Okay, so... That's the question we're addressing with this particular um, lesson today, this video. Now, before I can answer that question, I think I should tell you a little bit about me. So this is my story. Very briefly, I'll keep it you know, short and sweet. Now, uh, I currently, I'm currently in the Gold Coast in Australia. I live in Australasia. I love Thailand. I love Australia. And I spend a lot of time in those two. And, um, but uh, I was born in... Born and raised, born and raised in Kenya, which is uh, a country in Africa on the Indian Ocean. It's the one that you can see right there, uh, highlighted in red, and that's me in the in the little vehicle. That's my um, father's car. So Kenya, you know, when I was born, was referred to as a third world country, 
uh, a fairly poor country. We were not poor. I'd like to stress that we were not rich. We were not poor. <laughs> we were middle class. As you can see, that's a old Datsun 120Y. So by Kenyan standards, we were middle class. And um, what I'd like to say before we move on is that the country at the time was led by a dictator. By the t When I was born, by the time I was three years old, we had one president, the very first president ever. That, you know, that the country has ever had. And then when I turned three in 1978, a new president took over and he ended up being a dictator that ran the country for the next 24 years. So from the age of three until 27, um, I was uh, in a country that was run by a dictator. So uh, you can imagine the kind of um, crazy stuff that happened in that country, like uh, way too much to even start mentioning here. All I need you to sort of know is that um, things were quite tough and although we were a middle class family in a country that is quite poor, these are actual pictures taken from Kenya, um, when you're surrounded by a lot of poverty and red, led by a dictator, um, things get a little bit dicey, you know, like your mind is sort of conditioned very oddly, you know, with a lot of limitations, with a lot of... Um, um, uh, you know, um, different emotional jams, you know, so I had personally, I had, a uh, from, you know, from growing up there, plus a sort of difficult child childhood. I had a trauma, PSTD, I had a self-worth and self-esteem issues, uh, a whole bunch of stuff, you know, and I just doubts and everything and, and, and so on. And somehow inside me, this is a weird, odd thing inside me. I knew that I could do way better. Like, I just wanted to live my my best life ever. I wanted to contribute. I wanted to, um, I was excited. And the thing that excited me most, I had a dream of moving to the land down under Australia. For some reason, it was, um, I don't know why, it just, it just attracted me like magnetically. And, um, you know, it, 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 it was like this pool. But I, you know, but I, but I kept wondering, like, how on earth am I gonna get from here to there? How am I gonna escape and live my dreams? Because, you know, coming from this country, like the average salary, my first job, I only have ever, I've ever, only ever had a job for about a month and a half. That's the longest I've been uh, employed, and uh, I was uh, seventeen. Um, you know, before that, I'd sort of, you know, done odd jobs, but I'm talking about a proper employment. I was 17 and I was working as an accountant at uh, one of the biggest hospitals, private hospitals in, in Mombasa, Kenya. Guess how much my salary was? It was 2000 Kenya shillings as a, as a, you know, as a young, you know, up, <laughs> uh, accountant at the time. And, and to be honest, that's about 20 US dollars in a month. So, you know, um, trying to get here on a salary of $20 a month was ridiculous. So I just quit that job within a month and a half. I was like, that's it. This is not just not going to work for me. But I just still felt stuck. I was like, how am I going to escape and live my dreams, right? So, and even worse, how do I overcome my inner obstacles? That was my biggest, biggest question. I couldn't, I, I didn't know what to do. So guess what I did? I did what most people do. I tried everything. I tried that everything that most people try, you know. Um, here's a list of quite a lot of the things I tried, to be honest. I was, I'm not a lazy person, so, and I'm very curious and very, you know, I investigate a lot. So trust me, I tried everything, you know. And the truth is, all those things work and they helped, but they were not what made the big difference. What made, made the big difference, what actually changed my stars, you know, not just helped a little bit, but changed my stars, was um, a secret weapon that I found. And this secret weapon, which I'll tell you about in a moment, was easier, faster, better, and it worked. It actually worked. So um, within no time, I was, you know, after I got into it, I was able to travel, which before it was very difficult, like to get visas and everything was extremely super difficult. But as soon as I started traveling, I ended up going to all five continents, uh, uh, you know, over 30 countries, lived in several of them. You know, this is these are just like a, a three pages from, uh, I, I think I've been through, I've, I've, I've consumed... I think about I'm on my seventh passport because they just get full, full, full. Okay, some of them get expired or whatever, but generally they get full of stamps and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, I was, I'm very grateful and uh, because I've been fortunate to go around and see, uh, you know, 
see the world and um and 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 uh, I was also and I'm also fortunate and and honored to have been able to contribute to um the knowledge base of the planet in my own small way and uh these are screenshots from um one of you know one of my books on Amazon and uh some of the reviews and um um you know a, a few other things I've done and I was also able through this and many other efforts to you know develop a whole bunch of contacts and everything so um, I guess the question here is how did I overcome mine? How did I overcome my inner obstacles, my subconscious, you know, uh, junk, you could say. Now, to be honest with you, uh, just for, uh, uh, you know, for the sake of clarity, it's not, I'm not saying that I've overcome everything. No, I still have challenges. Like challenges will never end as a human being. But the important thing is like, how do you turn them into um, opportunities? How do you use them? How do you you know, overcome the present ones and then move forward. And then maybe tomorrow you'll get new ones, but then, you know, you're fine because, you know, you've got tools to move forward and, and so on. You know, you see, you see what I'm trying to say? So when I say overcome, uh, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that everything ends. It doesn't end. But what happens is um, once you discover what the tools are, all of a sudden an obstacle is no longer an obstacle. It's an opportunity. You understand what I mean? You, you start, real, you almost relish them. <laughs> so how did I overcome mine? And I'll tell you how I did it. I found something called the four masteries. The four masteries are my secret weapon. Okay. And um, I guess the question you might be asking yourself at the moment is, uh, how are the four masteries different from all the other things that we saw? You know, the, the long list of many other things that I tried and, um, you know, you probably tried and everything. Um, well, I, I suppose the easiest way to explain how the four masteries differ from everything else is um, most of the solutions, what they do is they try to fix you, okay, so that you can then be able to do what you are unable to do before you are fixed, so then you can have what it is you want, okay? That's how most sort of solutions work. They go fix, do, have. Fix me so I can do what I'm unable to do so I can have the result that I want. So instead of doing that, what we do is, with the four masteries, we forget about fixing for a while. We just forget about it, you know? Instead, we just do what we got, you know, what, what it is that we want to do or we know we should do because generally most, most of us know what to do. It's just that we're either too slow to do it or we're too afraid to do it or we're too, you know, procrastinate doing it or we don't do it or we're too scared to do it, whatever, you see. But we actually know what to do. Sometimes it's as simple as saying no. Like you want to, somebody asks you to do something that you don't want to do and maybe you're, you're a people pleaser, for example, let's just say, you say yes, but inside you wanted to say no. So you knew that no was the right answer, but you said yes because you don't want to, you know, you want approval and all that sort of stuff, right? So what these things do is that they put fix last, okay? And we put the action do, doing the action first instead of last. Have you noticed that's the switch here? So instead of fix do have, you have do, and then you have, and then you notice and you'll allow the automatic fixing. Okay, so that's... That might sound a little bit complicated right now, but trust me, it's going to get very clear. Um, and I'll explain it in a bit. Just bear with me for now. Uh, what, what, I, what, I, what I want to mention right now is that the reason why we do it this way is if you try and fix first, have you noticed how long fixes take sometimes? You know, some of us have things we've been trying to fix for decades, right? <laughs> so <laughs> instead of waiting for decades, or waiting for wherever long, just go ahead and do it right now in the present moment, right? So that's why we put fix last. I mean, we still want the fix, but we don't want to wait until it's fixed 10 years from now or two years from now or a year from now so we can finally do and live our life. You know, we want to do and live our life now and then allow that doing and, and that new having to automatically create the fix. I don't know whether that made a little bit of some sense um, um, there, right? So, because what we do is we bypass the things by doing by by using this new method, do have notice and allow automatic fix, and I'll show you how that's done in a second. What we're doing is we are bypassing the things that make us get stuck. 
So we bypass the subconscious conditioning that we bypass the fear, we bypass the, the programming. So, you know, we bypass it by not trying to fix it, you know, so in that way we create momentum, okay? So we just go ahead and pull the trigger and do, we just pull the trigger, okay? Now, having said that, because let's say you're doing something that you're afraid of, of course you're gonna have resistance, you're gonna have some kind of fear, you're gonna have some kind of whatever, you know, some kind of resistance, right? So um, how, how, do you, how do you deal with that resistance? Because that's why you couldn't do stuff in the first place, you know? Well, that's where the four masteries come in, and I'll show you in a, in a, in a, in a second. The four masteries actually allow you to do that which you are afraid of doing or, could, or thought you couldn't do or held yourself back from doing. They allow you to do it anyway, and then, as shit hits the fan, you know, as you start freaking out or whatever, the four masteries then take over that and boom, create the healing, create the fixing. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You see what I'm, uh, do you get what I'm trying to say? So for example, let's say you're, uh, let's stick with the people pleaser. Let's say, for example, I'm not saying you're a people pleaser, but let's say you are, okay? And you usually say yes when you mean to say no. And for the life of you, you can't say no. You just keep saying yes, yes to everything that everybody asks you to do, even when you don't want to say yes to. So next time somebody comes, the same person who usually asks you to do weird stuff that you don't want to do, they come to you and they say, hey, Dave, do you mind doing this and this? Just before you say yes, you go, no. And then all of a sudden, you'll notice your emotions flare up. <gasps> I just said no. Then what happens? The four masteries will take over that and sort it out. So... Let's get into the four masteries and we'll learn how that works. But do you see the power of doing that? So you don't wait until your people pleasing is fixed. You go ahead and do what you, you need to do. You let the body flare up and then you the four masteries take over and sort of fix that in the moment. That's why they're so powerful. That's why they don't spend, you know, they don't waste time like other um, other uh, modalities or other healing programs or whatever you want to call them. I'm not saying they are bad. They do have their place, but this is like the super fast way of doing it. Now, when we're dealing with the four masteries, we approach life from the idea that the obstacle itself is the way. Okay. And this is a quote here by Marcus Aurelius, who was one of Rome's greatest emperors. And he says, the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way, you see? So um, the four masteries, using that sort of approach to life, the, the fact that instead of avoiding obstacles or being fixed or we're good enough, we just go for the obstacles, right? that approach enables you to do what you thought you couldn't be able to do before. And it enables you to fix yourself on the fly, right in the middle of action. Okay? <laughs> and that's why these four masteries can overcome just about any entrepreneurial obstacle you face because nothing is too big for them. Nothing is too big for these things. Everything from doubt to fear to the craziest, weirdest, traumatic things you can imagine, you name it, you can use the four masteries. That's how cool they are. I've used them for just about everything, you know? I put that beep on everything. <laughs> Anyways, so once you get comfortable with the four masteries, you literally get excited when you see an obstacle coming your way. I mean, you might still freak out or whatever, but there's also another level of excitement because, you know, I'm going to handle this, man. I'm going to ride it and it's going to come out all right. You know what I mean? You literally look for the bastards. You look for them. You're like, you know, an obstacle comes your way. You're like, yep, let's go. Let's get into it. You know, suddenly nothing is impossible. Now, a word of warning, a real quick word of warning. The four masteries will cause an automatic awakening in you. That will happen. Okay. You're going to awaken to your true self. Um, free from the shackles and baggage of the conditioned small sense of self. And we'll talk about that in a second. But the reason why this is a warning is because that process is not always going to be comfortable and you're not always going to be in control of that process. So I have to tell you this right now. Um, there's a part of you, a deep wisdom within you that will start to orchestrate certain things in your life. And you might find yourself sometimes taking what looks like one step back and then two steps forward. Sometimes it look like that. You might actually think, oh my God, my things are actually getting worse. Why am I doing this? But if they're not getting worse. It's part of the healing process. You know, they, 
If your perspective is causing you to look at something fearfully, for example, you will be released from that perspective, that fear, but to be released from that, you might find yourself in the middle of that fear. Does that make sense? So that you can then see that there's nothing to be afraid of. So the four masteries will cause automatic awakening in you, and that's not always going to be comfortable, but when it happens, you're going to feel free, okay? It, 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 it's, it's, it's just something I got to tell you right now. Now, before I tell you about the four masteries, um, let me first quickly illustrate how... Um, what, what am I trying to say here? Before we can understand the solution, we have to understand the problem itself. Does that make sense? Sometimes to really understand a solution and know why it works and how to use it and have confidence in it, we have to understand the problem first. So uh, let's do that. Now, the first thing to understand is that you know, through the normal process of growing up, you know, from from our birth, from the moment we are born, you know, all the way till we become adults and so on, um, we have all gone through a process of domestication, socialization. Our con subconscious gets programmed and conditioned. And so the question here I'd like to ask you is, how do you control an animal that lives freely and naturally in nature? How do you do that? Like, let's say if you are to find a wild horse or, or even a dog, let's say like something that just lives freely and naturally in nature. You know what I mean? Like it just does its own thing when it feels like blah, blah, blah. That's what I mean by freely and naturally. How do you control such an animal? The answer is you program it, right? You condition it. You domesticate it. You socialize it. Correct? Does that make sense? Now, you, you can say the word train it. <laughs> you, you can say, you know, you train it or whatever. Um, um, or some people like to use the word discipline it, whatever. But that's, the, that's how you, you sort of, um, you, you control it. And by the way, human beings are animals. I'm sure you know that. But which means that the process of training or conditioning an animal is the same way that a human being is conditioned and, and trained and socialized. You get what I'm saying? This is very important to understand because by understanding this, you start to understand why your subconscious is doing whatever it is that it's doing to you, you know? So how do you do that? How do you train a wild animal? How do you domesticate it? You do it through a system of rewards and punishment, okay? Does that make sense? Would you agree with that? So you reward the thoughts, the emotions, and the behaviors that you want to program into the creature, and you punish the ones that you want to program out of the creature. You know, it's the whole pain and pleasure principle. Like all creatures, they're sort of driven by the same two forces, pain and pleasure, you know? Um, pleasure and pain. They're like the left hand and the right hand that sort of guide us through life, pleasure and pain. Um, this is just basic psychology, but it's so important because we sort of forget about it. We... We don't realize that we've been socialized. We've been conditioned. You understand what I'm trying to say? This is what I'm trying to tell you. We have been conditioned. That's where the subconscious program is coming from. That's where those issues we just saw earlier, you know, that long list of issues, everything from PSTD to bloody anxiety to self-esteem issues, everything, it came up through this process, okay? Now, I don't know if that made sense. I think it did, right? So anyways, let's carry on. Now, that process of conditioning, uh, you know, what we just saw, it creates what we call a false self-image, okay? It creates what we call a comfort zone, you know, a comfort zone that the creature learns to unconsciously stay inside, okay? The, com <laughs> the comfort zone is where the creature knows that I'm going to be rewarded here. I'm going to be accepted here. I will not be punished here. Okay? I'll be, in quotes, safe here. Okay? The comfort zone is the place where the, that creature that has now been conditioned, it kind of stays there. It's stuck in there and it fears to go outside of that comfort zone, if that makes sense, you know? So the comfort zone is an area of programmed beliefs, you know, programmed thoughts, programmed feelings, or programmed feeling patterns, you could say, you know, you know, trigger, then, you know, a process happens in your head and your emotions and blah, 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 and then there's an action, you know, uh, or behavior, you know. So this whole set of programming um, within which the, cre the conditioned creature feels safe and assured of acceptance, belonging, approval, and survival is the comfort zone, 
Okay, does that make sense? Now, the interesting thing is the comfort zone could be made up of pure bullshit, like nonsense, and it still, in quotes, feels safe for that particular creature because that is all it knows. If, let's say, a person is born in slavery and from a kid they're enslaved, that's all they know. If they're born in, let's say, America, that's all they know if they have never gone out. If they're born in China, that's all they know if they've never gone out. If they're born in Kenya, that's all they know if they've never gone out. Do you understand what I'm saying? If they're born poor, that's all they know. until they go. If they're born abused, that's all they know. If they're born loved, that's all they know. So that's, it, it does, it's the, cont what I'm trying to get across is that the, the content of the comfort zone doesn't even need to be correct. It can be rubbish, but it still, in quotes, feels safe. So the comfort zone has nothing to do with truth. You know, it's all about beliefs of survival. That's what it is. It's just the beliefs of survival. And that's why it's a self, it's a false self. It's, it's a, it's an image of, um, it's a, it's a self view and a world view, a self image that is just made up and the creature calls it home. So it is the home of the conditioned identity that feels that it is doing the, in quote, right things to, in quotes, stay safe and, in quotes, do well as defined by its conditioning. Does that make sense? The rules that it was conditioned by tell it this is the right thing, this is how you stay safe, this is how you do well. And then when you tell that creature to go outside of the comfort zone, the creature feels threatened. It feels fearful. It doesn't really matter what is actually outside the comfort zone. It doesn't even check. You know, there could be gold there. There could be goodness. There could be riches beyond imagination. There could be good stuff waiting for the creature outside of the comfort zone. But the creature will still be afraid of going out there. I don't know if that makes sense. Does it? So the point here is look at this diagram, you see. As you can see, the creature is sort of uh, entrapped in, in the little center by what it knows about itself. You know, what you know about yourself is what keeps you trapped in your little center, okay? But your potential outside is massive, okay? Massive. The potential is far greater than your false self-image, you know? So you don't even realize or recognize or know your potential. It's that vast. It's like an infinite ocean. It's like you're surrounded by infinity and love and light and wisdom and so much, but you can't sense it because that's all you know. <laughs> so this is the, this is, I hope this is defining what we're dealing with very clearly. You see what I'm saying? So the goal is this. This is the point. This is where we're getting at. We have only one goal, to release our brakes, release our brakes, and break the fuck out of the comfort zone, okay? <laughs> we have to sort of find technologies that enable us to leave our conditioned sense of self to our tiny self behind. You know, the, you know, you know what the, the hardest habit to break is? is the habit of being the conditioned self. That's the hardest habit to break. It's harder than... You know, quitting smoking or quitting drinking or quitting whatever the hell it is, um, breaking out of your conditioned sense of self is the hardest habit to break. But this, this is the important thing. The, the sense of self that we hold so dearly to is just a collection of ideas. Ideas. What do you think about God? Ideas. What do you think about yourself? Ideas. What do you think about your neighbor? Ideas. You know, what is a plant? Ideas. What is a, what is, what is a cat? Ideas. So we're a heap or a collection of ideas. That's all they are. You know? They're nothing but ideas. That's what a belief is. An idea that you keep running over and over and over and over. Conditioned. Do you understand? Repetitive idea. That's a belief. That's all it is. You know? But then because we, we identify with the idea, we say, this is me. <laughs> And that's why it sticks. But it's not you. It's just an idea you you picked up somewhere, you know. So when we leave the, the comfort zone, we're leaving those ideas in the past where they belong, where we pick them up. And we're going forward through into the infinity and engaging the vastness of our total being in the ever-present, in the ever-present ever now moment, infinity, 
That's why I told you the four masteries will wake you up. <laughs> you know, they're really crazy. They do that. So that's what these four masteries do. This is where they come in. Okay. And so um, we have a very simple choice to make as human beings. Uh, we can either switch our allegiance because we have an allegiance. We, we have an we have formed an allegiance with our conditioned false sense of self, that small uh, imagined sense of self that we've, you know, put together over time. We have pledged allegiance to it. You know, people go, this is just me, but, you know, just allegiance to a bunch of ideas, you see. So we can either switch our allegiance from that sense of self and switch it to the greater untethered true self, true being, you know, the unconditioned true self, because it's still in there, you know. It's, it's, it's not gone. Your true self, unconditioned, like, you know, what I mean is like, you know, you know the saying, be like a child, be like a child. A little infant born is not a clean slate. There's still, there's this infinite being in there and... It's not scared, it's not yet conditioned, it's not yet broken in. So through conditioning and socialization and education, that child adopts ideas. But these ideas don't mean that they have wiped out the, the true self. No, it's, it's, it's simply that the child's attention has been fixed to the small little ideas that it's been collecting but the minute that child releases that fixation on those small ideas, it will automatically find the true self because it's still in there, okay? So this is the choice we have. Where is our allegiance? To the false conditioned sense of self or to the untethered true self, okay? So if we don't switch allegiance from the false self to the untethered true self, the false self will forever hold us back. And... um you know, as Jesus said, a man cannot serve two masters. You know, that's, you know, that, that was actually an amazing thing that Jesus said. A man cannot serve two masters. We can either serve our small conditioned sense of self, you know, the false self, the unconscious ego, or we can serve our unlimited true self, you know, the, you know, the one that is free of programming. But we cannot serve both. Does that make sense? We can't serve both. Okay, and um, the four masteries are the way to begin doing that, uh, you know, serving your higher self. They allow us to bring our full and tethered soul to our entrepreneur's journey, you know, to our life in general. And when you do that, you experience divinity, you know, you get unstuck, you get unleashed. So um, the four masteries are literally the door out of the prison of the mind. And um, yeah, so that's, that's what the four masteries do for you in a nutshell. So I hope that kind of, does that make sense? Cool. So now let's look at what these four masteries are. And we just have to do it very, very briefly because um, obviously a short video like this is not enough to explain everything. But I'll do a brief, a, a good, you know, a, a, as good a job as I can to sort of introduce you to what they are. So these are the four masteries. Now, um, you may have seen this list before in uh, Don Miguel Ruiz's book, I think, The Four Agreements. But if you have, that's cool, but this is different. It's, it's, they, the names are sort of similar, you know, Awareness, Transformation, and Love, at least the Three Masteries. I think his book was called The Three Masteries, and we have the same names, but then the, the, we're, we're talking about, about uh, similar things, but kind of different. So I just wanted to mention that for the people who have read that book by Don Miguel Ruiz. It's a great book. It's called The Three Masteries, I think it is. Um, but if you have read that, that's good very good good book i've read it but this is a little bit different anyways so it's the mastery of awareness which is otherwise known as mindfulness i like to call it radical mindfulness because um the kind of mindfulness we're talking about here is not you know it's not the you know you know it's not the oh when i get up in the morning i turn on my mindfulness meditation app and i do mindfulness for 20 minutes i mean that's cool but that's not what we're talking about here we're talking about a completely different thing. So anyways, the mastery of awareness or mindfulness, the mastery of transformation, which has several practices as you're about to see. Then you've got the mastery of love and then you've got the mastery of asking. Okay, now let's quickly define those things. So um, the mastery of awareness, otherwise known as mindfulness, is the idea of going through life as a witness instead of 
identifying. So what does that mean? Have you ever looked outside? I'm sure you have. Of course you have. That's an odd question. Okay, when you look outside and you notice clouds passing or traffic passing or people passing or, you know, things passing by, you know, you don't identify with the cloud that is moving across the sky. You don't identify with a car that has just passed through, you know, uh, by your window. You just witness them. Do you understand what I'm saying? You, you witness them as phenomena passing through your awareness. Now, the problem is, as human beings, because thoughts seem to be inside our head and because we feel feelings uh, inside our body, we think that's me. So instead of witnessing the thought and the emotion, we identify with it. You see, did you, did you see, did you, did you see that switch there? Very important. So mindfulness says, although we have been sort of conditioned to identify with the thought stream and with the emotion flow, instead witness it. Don't identify. This is the idea of detachment. So we're not saying you try and block out your thoughts. We're not saying try and empty your mind. Don't try. Don't even bother. Just whatever crap you think of, let it be, okay? Whatever emotions you have, do not try and deny them. Do not try and block them. Do not try and repress them. Let them flow. All we're saying is witness them instead of identifying with them. What, what does that do when you do that? All of a sudden, you're able to know yourself. You become conscious. You become aware of what is triggering you, what are the processes going on inside you, how they are working, blah, 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 blah. You know, so you become conscious instead of unconscious. This is how you bring out the subconscious and make it conscious. Because when you're unconscious, you're entranced. You're owned by the phenomenon that is passing through your awareness. But when you're conscious, you're not owned by it. You're not entranced by it. You're just simply aware of it. And that is a massive shift. At the beginning, you might not even think you're doing much. But over time, you develop this freedom that is ridiculously cool. Like, unbelievably cool. <laughs> you go ninja. It's unbelievably not just liberating, it's just, I don't know what to tell you, it's liberating, it's um, transformational awareness. The minute you have awareness of something, all of a sudden transformation happens by itself. Does that make sense? So, um, as you can see, this is a lifestyle. It's not a thing you do for 20 minutes in the morning. This is, you develop the, the habit of going through life as a witness rather than ident and as an identity. Anyways, you know, this can be taught. There's step-by-step -step lessons that I've got for you somewhere else. But right now, it's, I can't teach you this in this short, uh, 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 you know, the exact how to do it, this how you do it, blah, 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 in this short video. For now, we just have the one screen to quickly explain what that mastery is. Uh, but I hope that made sense. I hope that made sense. Now, let's, let's look at the next one. The mastery of transformation. This is a second mastery. And before I go on, I just want to say this. These four masteries work together you combine them, you put them together and you apply them on everything. Like literally, I put that shit on everything. <laughs> okay, so the mastery of transformation, what does that mean? This is, this is a set of practices. These are actions. These are not things that you sit down and sort of chant or hum or tap or meditate. These are, you have to do these things. These are the doage, okay? So real quick, you got the practice of self-acceptance. You literally accept yourself as you are in this moment, in quotes, unfixed. So, you know, people think, oh, I got to get fixed. I got all these issues. I'm some broken, whatever. No, you accept yourself as you are. That is a decision to take, right? So this is not, this is a, it's actually a decision. It's a choice to make in the moment. Um, radical honesty. Um, I'm going to have to move faster. I uh, can't describe each one. Radical honesty to yourself and to others. That doesn't mean that you have to say everything that comes to your head to everybody. But what what that means is that you you know you don't bullshit yourself. Okay. Radical honesty and 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 it helps in so many ways. The minute you say I'm going to practice radical honesty, remember that example we gave of the people pleaser. If they are honest with self, themselves and they want to say no instead of yes. Radical honesty makes them say the truth. They're like, I really actually don't want to do this thing that this person is asking me to do. So the answer is no. And you tell yourself the truth, no. And you tell the other person the truth, no. Then what happens? You freak out. Then what happens? 
the practice of mindfulness takes over and you witness the freaking out instead of being entranced by it. And that, by the way, will cause a lot of transformation by itself. Now, moving on, the practice of self-assertiveness. -assertive that's, again, radical honesty. You, you want to say no uh, instead of yes. And by practicing self-assertiveness, you said no. That is self-assertiveness. Uh, emotional vulnerability, that's being open to all your emotions instead of trying to like hide and dodge. Again, that kind of works with radical honesty. See, these are very self-explanatory. They're not that complicated. I mean, I teach them in deeper ways, but what I'm trying to say is that they're not that complicated, you know? Emotionally vulnerable, uh, self-determination, self-responsibility, silencing your inner crit critic. Now, that's a bit of a dangerous one because we're, we're, we're not saying that you need to force your mind to have no thoughts but you know we'll get deeper into that anyways uh, the practice of living consciously the practice of personal integrity the practice of building your self-esteem which by the way is just you know uh, being self-assertive and so on uh, that kind of builds your self-esteem um all of this can be sort of be included in the one thing called the practice of just doing it just pull the trigger just pull the trigger so Instead of like going, oh, should I? Oh, I don't know. But then I feel, I feel bad. I'm going to hurt them. Oh, yeah. But then, you know, uh, you know, uh, all these battles inside, just pull the trigger and see what happens. You know what I mean? <laughs> so all these are the practices of the mastery of transformation. Why are they call that? Because when you actually, these are things you do. I think you've noticed that, right? When you do these things, they force you to do things that you otherwise kind of, trick yourself into avoiding but because you've you've known okay i'm gonna be honest i'm gonna um be vulnerable and i'm going to um be self-assertive you stop conning yourself into rubbish so this is what this and then and then they also make you act you know with without any guarantees of what's going to happen because a lot of times we don't act because we want to be sure we'll be safe these practices make you act even without the guarantee that you'll be safe. And it's only later by doing it that you notice, huh, I'm still here, I'm still alive, I'm still safe. Anyways, there's more to this, but I'm just gonna keep going. Now, the last thing I wanna mention with the Mastery of Transformation is, as you can see, it's written there, grief work. Grief work is literally what it, say, it sounds like. At times, things will happen that will shock us and will allow ourselves to grieve. Allowing yourself to grieve is the biggest healing thing you can do. If you need to cry, you cry. The point is you allow yourself to grieve, okay? But anyways, uh, again, we are not teaching everything right now. We're just sort of mentioning what the masteries are. The third mastery is the mastery of love, yeah? This one can be a little bit difficult to explain because love is one of those things. It's like trying to explain the creator or the mystery of where the Big Bang came from. You know, it's one of those things It's hard to explain or you know, like trying to explain, you know, like everybody thinks they know love, but there's as many definitions of love as there are people on the planet. So what I mean by this word love here is acceptance or as um, the Stoics used to say, amor fati, love fate, which means that whatever arises, love that. Okay. And why do you do that? Because everything is here to help you. So this is an approach whereby you're looking at life and thinking, whatever happens at every single moment, it's here to help me. Oh, I'm thinking crazy thoughts. Love them. Love those thoughts. Don't hate them. Oh, I'm feeling weird. Love yourself. Feeling weird. Don't hate yourself. Oh, that guy just did this to me. Love that too. That's an opportunity. When you sort of approach life from this point that everything is here to help you, uh, all of a sudden that acceptance of yourself it's kind of like leads you to the whole love your neighbor as you love yourself you know love your friend as you love yourself um it it it, it sort of it brings this oneness into a practical level and all of a sudden it releases you because you're no longer at war with reality you know you're no longer at war with the present moment so even if you don't understand it even if you don't like it you can still accept it. You can still embrace it and say, I may not understand this. I actually bloody hate it, but maybe it's here to help me. So I will love it anyways, even though I don't like it. You know what I mean? It shifts something. Anyways, moving on. Um, 
Then you got the fourth mastery, this is asking. Now, some people call it prayer, but that's a difficult word. Now, I gotta say, none of this stuff is religious. Personally, I'm not religious. If I had to pick a religion, I would say I'm Buddhist, but even then I'm not. Um, I was born in a Christian home. Um, I've studied so many different religions. I've, uh, um, you know, I've picked up so many things from everywhere. Um, so, I'm, but I'm not a religious person. But nevertheless, this it's 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 difficult it's difficult to explain this without using terms that are otherwise used in religion. So, um, if you find yourself resisting the words that I'm about to use, you know that's again that's just conditioning, man. Like. <laughs> Don't take yourself so seriously. So when I say prayer, I don't mean that the, the mastery of asking is kind of like prayer, but I don't mean like, you know, like, for example, kneel, you know, Catholic prayer where you kneel down and then you close your eyes and then you speak to a God that is in the skies. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that, and there's more to this, but it's kind of like a recognition that there is divinity within you and divinity in everything, sort of. You could say that. And you can ask for help for that divinity, from that divinity, and it will help you. But the divinity does not interfere. It gave everything free will. And the point of free will is that you can reject it if you choose to. So it cannot force itself upon you because it gave free will. So you have to give it permission. You have to ask. And you have to ask specifically. And when you do, all of a sudden, you re realize all this help coming from you. You are surrounded by an immense field of, you, I don't know what to say, how else to put it, like supremely powerful powers that are there waiting to help you. They're just there. They're not going to do anything until you ask. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Nor can you op be open up to you. These are practical forces. Do you know that a human being is made of 7 billion billion atoms and a single atom it's 99.999999% empty space so the human being is 99.999999999% empty space so you think you're a physical entity but you're mostly non-physical you know you're a non-physical entity it's just that your senses are physical and they only sense the physical but you're beingness is mostly fastly non-physical all that is ready and more all that and more is ready and waiting to assist you but you have to ask that's the point of free will because you have the freedom to deny the divinity but the minute when you know this and you choose to align with the divinity rather than the small conditioned self this is the game changer. This changes everything. And I'm not saying that all of a sudden all your problems will disappear and all your pain will go away. Um, but you will be surprised at how amazing life gets. And then it gets better and better and better and better. And then it gets better and better. And then it gets better and better and better. And then it gets better and better. It just keeps, it's, it just magnifies. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. And, um, but it doesn't go in just one direction, like up, 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 up. Sometimes, like I said, sometimes you think you're going a step backwards and you're like, what did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. That's part of the motion. Sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back. That's just part of the ebb and flow, the duality. Okay? So it's good to sort of be aware of that. So that's when you put all these four masteries together, including this last one, which is the game changer, all of a sudden... Boom. So think about that. Think about that. We looked at the actions in the mastery of transformation. Imagine you practicing radical honesty and self-assertiveness with the help of divinity and applying mindfulness so you can watch and be aware of what is happening and accept whatever arises. Do, do, you, do you see how this starts to work? Really cool stuff. Very good technologies. Now, those are the four masteries, but there's one more important thing that is part of, um, uh, you know, the, the question like, how did I do it? How did I get out of, um, you know, how did I achieve my dreams or start achieving my dreams? And how did I escape from um, the issues that I was having and, you know, start getting ahead? One important thing that I found was vision. Vision is, oof, vision is incredibly powerful and important. And I'm not talking about visualizing or putting a small little vision board on your on your mirror bathroom. That's that's like doubling in vision. That's like 
you know, that's like saying I want to get healthy, but I'm going to go to the gym for 30 minutes every week, once a week, 30 minutes. That's doubling in exercise. So having a small little vision board with a couple of stickers on your mirror, that's good. It's better than nothing, but that's doubling. That's not really taking vision seriously, man. You know, <laughs> we're talking about something else here. Whatever it is you think vision is, go times a hundred or times a thousand. That's, we're talking about mastery of vision. Now, Einstein said that imagination is the most is more important than knowledge. Imagination is the language of the soul. I think he said this, you know, a lot of things are said that Einstein said, Einstein said, and sometimes we don't know whether he actually said this, but I, I do know that Einstein talked a lot about imagination as being the most powerful force. I know that for sure. Um, um, so whether he said these exact words, I wasn't able to determine, but I do know that Einstein kept going on and on about imagination being the most powerful force. So in any case, my question is, why would Einstein, one of the biggest geniuses the world has ever seen, keep going banging on about imagination? Because the guy really talked a lot about imagination. He was like, it's the best, it's the best, the most powerful stuff, whatever. You know? <laughs> why would a genius, if that wasn't true, why would he say that? That would be embarrassing if it was not true, right? So I just want to impress upon you that um, this is the power of vision and and the idea here is that nothing can stop the magic of the mind and the and, you know mind and heart power once you apply it. And the magic of mind and heart power is vision. Vision is the map. Okay. When you create a clear, compelling vision, it will pull you forward. That's the point. When, you know, you build your dream, and then the dream will pull you. The dream will build you. Build the dream, and then the dream will build you. Okay, so what we're talking about here is creating a quantum vision, like a vision. I'm saying quantum because you'll see why. Anyways, let's just call it a vision for now. A vision that will literally pull you over the bumps, over the hurdles, and, and into whatever your best life looks like, you know, as an entrepreneur and as a person, as a human being. So it's a well constructed and practiced vision. And when you have that, it can even overpower broken sub, uh, subconscious conditioning. You could be like messed up as hell, right? But if your vision is that clear and big, the vision itself will fix the, 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 the subconscious conditioning and issues. And it will create circumstances that drive you through fixing them so that you can get to the vision manifested. Does that make sense? A good vision literally pulls you, okay? And a good vision, actually, it overpowers limitations such as no time, no money, no skills, no resources, no knowledge, whatever the hell limitation you can name, a good vision is, I haven't found a, whatever, a case where vision doesn't kind of pull you over anything. You know, it's it's nothing that I've found that can beat vision. <laughs> it's, it's just, a great vision is unbelievable. It's like a living map. Now, just to give you an example of how powerful vision is, um, do you know this guy? This guy is called Mahatma Gandhi. <laughs> He's the guy who brought down the British Empire with nothing but a loincloth and a vision. So if you've never heard of this guy, what happened is that uh, Britain, when Britain was an empire, you know, it, it colonized the United States and Australia and Kenya and all this, but it also colonized India. And it colonized India for, depending on who's counting, roughly 200 years, you know. So... What happened is that with all of Britain's industrial and military might, the Indians found it almost impossible to gain independence by physically fighting for it, okay? So physical action, although there were so many Indians, hundreds of millions of Indians or whatever, and just a few thousand Britons, the Indians were outgunned. So they couldn't take over power back from the colonial uh, Britain. So, you know, they were outgunned, basically. And then in comes this guy with Andes, uh, Gandhi. He comes in and do you know what he did? He said, no violence. Um, we're not going to do that. We're not going to go fighting and all that. All he did was construct a super strong vision, a quantum vision. He saw it so clearly where everyone was equal, everyone was free, and, 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 and all the colonial laws and injustices were not there. And he just saw it so perfectly, and he lived as if that reality was already there. So he just ignored all the colonial shit, you know, all that rubbish. Oh, don't do this, don't go there, whatever. He's like, whatever, man. <laughs> and, and he just went around India telling the story, telling not the story, um, sharing the vision over and over and over and over again. And um, and long story short, um, 
that that worked you know he he managed without a single weapon to bring down the empire he brought the empire to his knees with nothing but vision shared okay that's how the indians got freedom india pakistan they got freedom and i think bangladesh as well because of this guy and his supervision and he's not the only one right he's not the only one i mean phew, steve jobs apple vision it, it, it's, uh, mother teresa vision people with vision change everything right but having said that please don't misunderstand or misquote me i'm not saying that you will get everything that you put in your vision because you won't to be honest with you i have to be honest with you you're not going to get everything that you slap into your vision okay so some things will come true and some things will come true way way better than you even hope for and some things will not come true at all and the reason why is um it may not be on your life path you know that divine force that brought you here and sustains you the thing that is we call alive the thing that goes when you call in quotes die that thing has a purpose a mission it you're not randomly here okay <laughs> so anything that is not going to jeopardize your purpose yeah why not you can have that but things that will jeopardize your greater life purpose you're not going to have them like you can do whatever you want you can fight struggle do all your efforts you're not going to have them but having said that please don't use that use that as an excuse i've met a lot of people who go oh I probably won't get that cuz it's not in my life purpose. So a lot of people use that as an excuse to just kind of quit. So it's it's sort of like a it's a hard line to it's a thin line to walk because you don't know am I not getting this thing cuz I'm just sabotaging myself or am I not getting this thing cuz it's not in my life purpose. So it's kind of tricky to navigate, but you know, once you start putting all, everything together, you start to learn to relax and at some point you even sort of just you're clear on what your vision is but you sort of let go on if and when and where things happen if that makes sense so you're not desperate you're not clinging you're not attached you know so you're clear on the vision but you're not you know what i'm saying you're not staying in wanting you know it's 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 a sort of the more you do it the more you learn how to do what i just say uh, and i'm not even saying that i'm a master at it i'm not but you know it's something it just becomes better and better and better and i don't know if there's an end to the becoming better at it you know what i mean <laughs> but there is definitely a progression you you grow into it you grow better okay so yeah so some things will come true some things will come true better than you hope for some things won't come true at all and some things you realize you didn't even want them in the first place so you will actually drop them out of the vision yourself you know maybe you wanted them because i don't know maybe through your conditioning maybe there's something you know you thought oh if i have this thing it will prop up my image and you know my neighbors will think i'm cool and then maybe over after a while you realize i don't care about the neighbors and then so this thing you thought you wanted also suddenly you're like i also don't care about this thing you know what i mean so those kind of things will happen and a, a whole lot of other things that also weren't in your vision will also happen like life will happen generally a bunch of other things <laughs> that you didn't even expect or or count for or visualize they'll happen as well so you know and you will still have challenges you still have opportunities regardless um you know your problems will just magically all end just because you know you've got a vision so you you know you know you because challenges are still in, you know a part of being human as long as you're human you will have challenges you know that is life it it has the duality there's a push pull you know so um I guess what I'm trying to say is that in life I find that we have far less control than we think we have. We have way less control than we think we have. But that little control is far more than we actually need. So the little that we actually have is way more than we need, you know? The amount of control we have is tiny, but that tiny amount is extremely powerful and it is far more than we need. You know, it is adequate. Um simply by, you know, that alignment in your heart um that's that's kind of all you need but it's you know the heart mind the vision and the the you know the heart space stuff that's all you need and it's so powerful you, it's way more powerful like we're not even using 5% of it that's the point so the we cannot control all the phenomenon that is happening around us like we cannot we don't have direct control over that we don't even have direct control over 
most of the stuff that's going on with, inside us. So the thing that we do have control, you know, the vision and the heart space stuff, that's more than you need. It's more powerful than you, you can even, like you're never gonna exhaust the power. It's, 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 it's inexhaustible and that's all you need. That's what I mean by, we have a very tiny amount of control, but that tiny amount is extremely powerful and it's more than adequate, you know? Now, having said that, having given that warning that, yeah, some things will come true, some things won't, blah, blah, blah. Even after having said that, a vision is one of the coolest, most powerful things you could have. So I wasn't knocking vision. I wasn't saying, ah, you know, some things won't happen anyway, so forget it. No, 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 don't forget it. Vision is the biggest, coolest thing you can have. Well, one of the biggest, coolest things you can have. So, you know, definitely want to, you know, want to do that. So what I find funny is that... Uh, Vision is not taught in our societies, in our schools, but, you know, our governments. Almost nobody ever talks about this in government, in society, in schools. You know, they talk about jobs, about work hard, about the economy as if it's an independent monster, completely out of control. But they just about never talk about vision. I mean, let me ask you a question. When is the last time you saw a politician or a teacher spending a significant amount of time teaching their followers or students or whatever, constituency, how to craft a powerful vision and believe in it. it. I just can't remember a single time I've seen that happen, like a politician or a teacher or whatever, spend time doing that, you know? You know, like I've seen old black and white, you know, uh, TV footage of, you know, Ke President Kennedy giving a speech about landing someone on the moon or, you know, Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King, you know, about freedom or Mother Teresa or, you know, whatever. But those are like few and far between. On the whole... This powerful thing called imagination is actually discouraged by authorities, you know, which I find completely weird because, you know, powerful inventors and creators, you know, such as Steve Jobs, Albert Einstein, uh, Walt Disney, all these guys, um, uh, what's her name, uh, Harry Potter, um, uh, J.K. Rowling, you know, all these people, like, they, uh, they credit imagination as being one of the most powerful forces in the universe. So it's very strange to me that the authorities don't talk about it. That's odd, don't you think? Anyways, after being hidden from you, it's now in your hands. And what I mean by that is that uh, you now have a chance to create a compelling vision that includes all of life holistically, you know? So family life, uh, social life, uh, business life, and so on. And, and, um, you know, and, and when you're talking about entrepreneurship, uh, you know, you look at the stages, the nine stages of entrepreneurial growth, which, like I said before, was covered in the first video. So I hope you've actually watched it because each stage has its own uh, recipe, you could say, recipe or formula. These are things that you include in your vision. So you, wherever you are, let's say you are stage four entrepreneur. Including your vision, all the recipes in stage four, for you know, to move from stage four, for stage five, for stage six, up to the stage you want to reach. Maybe, you know, a lot of people don't want to go to stage eight or nine, so maybe they want to reach stage six or seven or whatever, the, you know. So whatever those formulas are, put them in your vision. <laughs> so a holistic vision is one that includes social life, whatever, spiritual life, uh, um, uh, business, entrepreneurial life, whatever. So the whole you, the whole self view, the whole world view is sort of congruent and as one. That's what I mean by creating a quantum vision, okay? So it's your whole sort of life. It's not a bunch of goals or a to-do list or, you know, a small little thing on your mirror. It's, you're literally sort of like, it's almost like a book above my, a book about my life. Almost, well, it doesn't have to be a, like a big book, but you understand what I'm trying to say. It's like it it co it covers everything, like literally written down. So this is not stuff that you keep in your head, written down. Um, you know, pictures. Uh, you know, and placed everywhere. Like I place mine on my phone. You know, the the you know the phone the what do you call that when your phone is turned off the the screen that's over there and then when you turn on your your phone there's the other screen i don't remember i think it's called wallpaper or whatever it's called the off screen and the wallpaper screen whatever on my phone uh my my pads my tablets my laptops my computers um my um uh what do you call it um you know those kind of like photo slider things that you can have they look like an ipad but they're real cheap and you just put a USB with photos and they just keep sliding, you know, over there, I've got a my movie. It's like they're everywhere, you know, like it's kind of like you've designed your life and then you've plastered that design everywhere. And then you kind of like, 
so you're seeing it but then you're not obsessed with it you're not like attached like oh how come i'm not there yet oh i'm failing or whatever so you you kind of open as well for divinity to make choices for you you know oh that might not be good for you or this might be better for you so do you understand what i'm trying to say but the point what i'm trying to say here as well is it's holistic and it's not doubling it's not doubling it's like you know it's not like Oh, I'll spend five minutes and draw and write a paragraph and that's it. That's my vision. That's not what I mean. I'm saying go for mastery. <laughs> okay, mastery. So it's like 10x or even 100x or even 1000x, whatever amount of time or attention that you've given in your past, in the past that you've given to vision. Go now 10x or 100x. That's the game. That It's a game changer. Okay. Anyways, we cover that in detail um, uh, in, in a full course that I actually have a full course on this, but I just wanted to mention that. Um, so just to sort of close up this, pre uh, this, this particular video, uh, this presentation, is I want to mention this concept called the, tri the triangle of execution, okay? Now, what's in, what's in the, tri what's the unconscious entrepreneur's triangle of execution? Is the idea that... Um, if you want to achieve anything as an entrepreneur, when you look at it as, okay, you need a map to get there, you need a vehicle that will get you there, and you are the driver. So the driver, the map, the vehicle, you want to go. The entrepreneurship is a journey, right? It's a journey. You need, it needs a map, a vehicle, and the driver. So let me quickly say what that is. The driver is obviously you. You're the driver. Okay, so by becoming a well-equipped driver, you've got the four masteries and you've got the vision. That's what we've been talking about today. Um, then you need a map. The map, we covered it in the first video, which is the nine levels of, of the entrepreneurial journey. And the vision, the vision is also part of the map. <laughs> so you see what I'm trying to say? The, the vision is kind of like crossing, it's part of the map, it's part of the driver. Okay, and what is the vehicle? The vehicle is the business machine that you build in accordance to the recipes that you find at each of the nine levels in the entrepreneurial journey. So the vehicle is the business machine. How do you build that business machine? You follow the recipes, depending on where you are on the, on the nine levels of the entrepreneurial journey, you make sure your, your vehicle is built according to those standards, according to those specs, because then that vehicle will be able to move to the next level, to the next level, to the next level. So. These three, the driver, the map, the vehicle, form the triangle of execution. You can also think of it as body, mind, and spirit, okay, <laughs> in a way. Um, so that's the point. That's where I'm trying to get all this uh, together. I'm trying to sort of sh show you how they sort of all fit. And I hope that makes sense. I hope that kind of makes sense, right? The driver is you. You've got the four masteries and you've got the vision. The map are the nine levels on the entrepreneurial journey so you know exactly where you're going and the vision is also part of the map then you got the vehicle which is a business machine built according to the recipes the prescriptions the recipes inside the different levels on the nine levels on the entrepreneurial journey so at each level you sort of look at your vehicle and you say oh this is the recipe i need to apply oh good now my vehicle is sorted it's going to move to the next level or whatever so i hope that made sense thank you very much um uh please join us uh in the next video because in the next video i'm sort of gonna use a like a, a sort of like a case study to show you how these three kind of fit together driver map vehicle like a very simple simplified case study so you see how these pieces fit together so you can sort of get that um ownership experience and know how it will apply to you specifically so and 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 you'll be able to see that this is actually practical stuff that you can apply in your business uh as an entrepreneur very very practically so that's very exciting that's going to be in the next video thank you see you there thank you for watching this video i hope you got something out of it if you wish to get more of the same if you wish to go deeper into these ideas and practical solutions we have something free for you you can download your free Illustrated Entrepreneur's PDF booklet. You can also watch the free three-part Entrepreneur's video course. Click on the link in the video description below. Thank you and enjoy.